Right, good morning colleagues. Thank you very much for your time. Um, today's focus is around uh, managing um, staff who are delivering report, uh, remote learning. Uh, a lot of the, the issues, a lot of the information is just as relevant to managing the student experience. So if you're managing remote learners, because the environment we're in, it, it has notably changed. Um, if you have any comments uh, or questions in the live session, if you can put them in the chat and we'll pick them up at the discussion at the end. Um, and Kenji will uh, remind me or pick up any points that we need uh, in, in terms of points of clarification or points for discussion. Our focus is really around, I suppose, two strands that are quite important. Uh, the first is management generally, how do we manage successfully? And the second is, what do we need to know about learning, pedagogy, remote learning, really to underpin good management decisions, good management judgments? Now, what just start off as we should with purpose or aims around the session, and it is about reflecting on the interpersonal approaches uh, to good management. Being familiar, there are a lot of models around learning design and a lot of principles around pedagogy, but I've tried to pull out one or two major examples, major themes. Six main learning types. There's a lot of uh, narrative, a lot of information around learning types and the interaction models that, that are used. And I wanted to pull them out to clarify some basic stuff that all managers should be comfortable with and familiar with. And a learning experience, how do you ensure it's planned well? How do you evaluate it appropriately? And the current context, of course, is quite different and quite significant. Um, initial training that staff have had presumed predominantly an on-site delivery model. Um, so a lot of the subtleties around the interpersonal skills are different uh, when you're working in an online environment, a digital environment. Um, and it is worth remembering that both initial training for staff engaged in teaching and training for managers engaged in management will have been based on this campus-based experience being at the core of what we do. Um, also, when we swiftly moved to remote, uh, it, it was quite significant. Although a lot of staff had experience in blended learning, uh, things like assessment or learner support tended still to be campus-based. So we have to reflect on how remote is different. Um, Managers also have the limited experience of teaching. Historically, managers, academic managers, taught, so had years of experience of classroom teaching, of assessment, uh, of the admin that goes around that, and of the support structures that go around that. Um, now, managers may have significantly, are likely to have significantly less experience of blended online, digitally supported delivery. Uh, so it's a different environment for them. And of course, we all had IT problems and there's the, the huge variability in staff skills and interest when we moved to a significantly more remote model. And when we talk about managing in the current context, um, we don't have a staff and managers the level and the style of personal and interpersonal support or feedback you would typically have on site. It was always quite simple to go and speak to someone in student support if a a learner had an issue around housing or finance. You could get small tips here and there. You can test things. You can send people directly to them very quickly. So it is a different type of model where you need to be very clear about making links about the, the people that you refer to. And it's not as easy to have a one or two sentence conversation just to check somebody's gone for advice or, or have had the support that they've needed. Um, the central services quite often are more difficult to access. It's not quite as easy to go down or set up an appointment in a straightforward way. Um, I think the other thing around managing in the current context is, without exception, people know how stressful and difficult uh, the current environment is. And the issue of managing stress has to be foremost in your thinking as a manager and high in your thinking as a, a person teaching it remotely or online. Um, and one theme that I want to stress is the idea of giving managers, giving staff, giving students as much control over the work as practical, uh, because it's a one well-researched and well-found strategy that will minimise stress without necessarily changing workload. 
Um, and all this can be supported by, by training, by CLPL, if uh, the opportunities are there and if they're there at a practical time. Um, you also want to have a clear operational structure, clear guidance, and ensure good personal and individual supports in place. Those sound like historical and obvious, uh, but I have to say in the rush of getting things done, uh, those things can suffer. As a manager, the, the key to success is to agree tasks and objectives and hand over as much autonomy and authority as practical. So you're laying out what you want staff to do, what you want achieved, and you want to step back as far as possible and leave the method, the timing, the approach as far as practical um, for them to do. I think one of the keys as a manager it, to recognizing how this is gonna work is people won't do things as well as you will. Uh, that's how you're going to feel as a manager. If you hand over responsibility and autonomy, it won't quite be the way you would have done it, and you'll reflect and think, uh, if things were a little different. You have to accept that from the outset and accept that people will approach things differently. And that's the key to accepting their autonomy and authority. Um, if you micromanage, if you interfere, if you change decisions that they've made, um, you'll add to their stress rather than reduce the stress. So really, it's about having key parameters and a clarity about what you want achieved and then stepping back and monitoring, supporting rather than changing and interfering. And as a manager, that's tricky because, to be honest, it's easier to prompt and support people when you're on site with them. You know, you can more regularly ask how something's going and you can tell by the eyebrows or the quick facial expression whether they're struggling, whether they're confident. Uh, but online, that, that subtlety will be lost. Uh, so you have to have a much more generic approach to here's broadly what I want you to do. Uh, let's arrange times to touch down um, and talk about how it's going, but avoid the temptation to interfere and change decisions that they've made unless things are, are drastically going in the wrong direction. And I think the touching base is an important element. You should diary time to touch base around projects, around programs that they're running. Diary time. Uh, to, to see how things are and to see how they're coping, how comfortable they are with it, how confident they are about it, and because there's a well-being as well as a completion element, if I can describe it in those terms, around what might be helpful and what might be useful. When you're setting out tax, uh, tasks and activities, um, you've got to set out how you're going to monitor and evaluate at the outset. Don't leave it until the end. Um, so if you're asking people to develop a new program or, or to write material for um, to plan next year uh, to, to decide what's going into the programs, uh, you have to decide dates, but you have to decide when you'll touch base to see partial completion, when you'll touch base to see if it's reasonable progress and how you'll judge uh, how efficiently or successfully it's gone. And you've got to be focusing on what can give staff useful feedback rather than simply give you confidence it's being completed. When we're talking about learning delivery being supported, um, this is a much more strategic area. You have to think through what you want in your learning delivery, what, what your success criteria are, because there are issues like satisfaction. It's not simply a attainment achievement element. Um, it's about satisfaction, it's about good progress and material, it's about confidence and delivery, it's about progression routes. There's a, a lot of things in this story, but you have to have an environmental scan. When you're making a plan, what are other colleges doing? What have you done with courses previously? What are other people in the college doing? Are they building in more technology, more learner support? Um, so the env environmental scan is always your starting point when you're making updates, revisions that are of any significance and your clear strategy that lays out a good sense of direction and the intended impact. And this is something that has to be shared with staff and it has to be shared with staff with a level of clarity and brevity. If you send your staff your 32 page strategic plan, um, you can guess how many people are going to read 32 pages and find it useful. Um, there's also, and I say this with a level of care, College senior managers, boards, and others spend a lot of time talking about um, their strategy, their priorities, those kinds of things. Um, quite often, it's fairly obvious and fairly succinct. 
um, you know, it covers broadly success, it covers inclusion, it covers finding work. Um, to send that kind of information out in a 30 page document or whatever, not the most useful way to do it. Um, so I think a clear strategy about improving uh, the intended success, whether that's um, achieving a, a certificate, whether it's achieving a university place, whether it's finding work, um, those kind of things need to be brief and clear. And an implementation plan, what resources are you getting? Training, support, milestones, outcomes. So the, the plans around these things should be shared in advance. And I have to say, uh, with a level of care, it's one of the things that's been a struggle at the moment. Uh, most people that would write an operational plan have spent so much time this year coping with changing circumstances that they haven't had enough time to look ahead. And I think it's important to look ahead. And I think it's important to lay out plans briefly, but clearly so that staff know where we're going later in the year and next year, because this is a point where we are talking about next year's activities, next year's plans. And again, monitoring and evaluation uh, is part of the the process, lay that out well and clearly in advance. This is what we want to do. This is how we'll know we're doing it well. Um, the other thing that we need to reflect on, I suppose, is the, the, I suppose the technology skills, the pedagogy, the interaction, the, the elements of learning that managers need to manage now uh, that have changed. And for many staff, the recent um, CLPL, the recent CPD, has been about um, using the technology. And it's not been about the pedagogy. And we need to reflect on that to make sure we have a confidence around the pedagogy. Um, it also tended to be around blended learning uh, rather than remote learning. So there was that assumption that you would be able to monitor and get feedback in a much more personal way. Um, you'd be able to encourage group work in a much more informal way. So we need to reflect on whether that, that has changed and what we need to do around the, the training for staff. Um, but one of the big messages around remote, distance, technology-supported learning is that the, the basics of good teaching is central. That is having good resources, clear explanations, using feedback, uh, those techniques that they use in class uh, are the same general techniques that will confirm and will support strong learning. Um, so revising, apply, applying knowledge, the things that you do in class well are the things that you do online well. And although technology means you at times need to do it a different way and feedback will be more difficult, the basics are good teaching hasn't changed very much for remote and distance learning, the principles of good teaching, how you deliver certain things, the technology you use, how you get feedback, those kinds of things have subtleties in them. But the fact is you still need to get the feedback, you still need to use the feedback, um, you still need to provide good learning support generally. Um, and students have to feel engaged with you. There has to be that interpersonal link and that confidence about the learning experience. Want to talk a bit more around the pedagogy uh, and the learning design principles for managers. And if you're not as uh, immersed in teaching, uh, these things will be a bit more distant and will have changed a little. Um, I suppose that the starting point is the learner has to be prepared. Um, we don't inherit learners who have good self-management skills or good independent learning skills entirely from schools. We get some, uh, but quite often that's a difficulty. And usually we deal with that with an on-site induction uh, where you take them to the library, you talk about the importance of these things. The online version is not always as thorough uh, or as, as detailed um, about encouraging them to, to map out a timetable, to work out what they're doing. Um, and one of the things that we have to do is make sure the learners are prepared not only to use the technology, uh, but do they have note-taking skills, do they have research skills, do they have study skills? Um, how do we know that? How, you know, we make sure we, we give them general guidance, but do we actually test that in any meaningful way? And without those skills, the idea of a stronger level of independent learning is, is a wasted opportunity. 
Um, so we want to not only make sure they are part of the induction, we want to find some ways of getting feedback and testing that those are the skills they've got because those are the skills they will use uh, for the coming year and more. Um, also, personal and learning support and motivation. Um, we can't take that for granted and we never do, but it is harder to motivate individually online and at a distance uh, when you don't know the student well and they don't know you well. Um, so you have to reflect on how motivated they are um, and do things, active things in the, in the first few weeks in particular, but certainly periodically to make sure that there are motivational activities. There's discussions with employers, uh, there, there's visits, there's development of CVs, um, that there's uh, useful international information shared to, to try and raise the, the horizons. So that's an element of what you should see in a well-designed experience. Um, there's a link there, it's some tips for learners just around uh, how learners can get the most out of virtual learning. Next thing I wanted to, to highlight was the idea of learning design and learning design models. And there's, there's a lot of material around uh, models of learning design or concepts of, of pedagogy. And what I've tried to do here is to pull out themes that appear in different areas, different uh, models uh, that are quite important that you should see in good learning and teaching if you're delivering uh, or if you're managing staff. It's the idea of breaking tasks or topics into stages or chunks. Um, identifying learning types, and we'll talk about the different types of learning experiences. It's learning types meaning learning experiences rather than the, uh, the learning types, kinesthetic, that kind of thing. Um, model and demonstrate possible outputs. So if they, have think, if they have essays to write, reports to write, summaries to write, if they have artifacts to create, modeling them, um, and online and remote delivery, to be able to see models uh, of what, what they have to achieve will help them understand the parameters and will help them produce better uh, artifacts, better essays, uh, better reports. Defining success criteria. So make sure you share the success criteria and provide opportunities for them to collaborate and give feedback as they're developing a report, um, a, an artifact, a piece of work. Giving clear guidance and group organization. If you're going to put them into groups, if they're going to work in pairs or work in groups, make sure the parameters are clear, the time scales are clear and everybody signed up to that. Um, you'll know even in live classroom teaching, you put people in groups, give them a task to do over three weeks, somebody's off week two, you know, that, that kind of issue will occur online as well, and, and possibly more so. Um, so you want to give clear and strong guidance about how that will work with the times and deadlines for submitting. And reflecting on basic motivational theory, making sure that as far as you can, uh, people are motivated to engage with the material and with each other. Um, so you, you need to revisit that. You need to go back to check their motivation, ask them how they're enjoying it, ask them can things be done differently, um, and make sure that you've, you've touched every base you can on general uh, motivation. And the idea of regular contact and feedback, pretty much an obvious one. But the key to all this is to present what's going to happen in the unit, in the program. All of this is an overview from the start. So the time skills, activities, meeting times, tasks, it's all as clear as practical from the outset. There's quite a well-known model, the ABC model, that's, that's used quite uh, confidently. Uh, it was develop, developed in the university sector, but it seems to be uh, fairly popular. W one reason I like it is there's a lot of YouTube videos that explain how it works and demonstrate how it works. But the, the principles behind that are quite common. Um, and what's quite important when you're planning as a manager what goes on is that you as a team as a teaching team make sure that you come together to make sure there's a blend of experiences uh, that your assessments are planned in a way that's coordinated and that their experience is planned the things that they're likely to achieve to attain overlap whether there can be any um, coordination of tasks uh, any pulling together of, of learning create a team summary of the, the course or unit and create a storyboard with the different learning activities. So it shouldn't simply be you sitting down to plan your own class. But the idea of good practice would be to try and work as a team to make sure there's a range of, of good elements in there. Um, and there's a couple of short videos that introduce the ABC model, just as an example uh, of a, a learning design model that might be useful. 
the learning types I talked about earlier. As a manager or as a teacher, uh, there are things that you would want to see in a good remote learning experience. Um, and it would be around including these six learning types. So acquisition, the common one where people watch a video, listen to a lecture, um, read a set book. Um, that's the, the least interactive, but will probably feature in most programs at, at some time. But what you want to do is to use the others as, as well as you can and as often as you can. Inquiries where they would have to look for a book or identify an internet site or evaluate. Um, discussion where you would work in groups or work uh, as a whole class um, would be to reflect on things that have gone well, uh, things that they've learned, things that they disagree with. Um, and organizing debates or organizing um, follow-ups from any lectures, videos, uh, or, or tasks is a successful way uh, to move them on. Practice is an obvious one. They generate an action. They get and use feedback whenever they practice, whenever they create an artifact, whenever they undertake a task, is to make sure they get feedback. Collaboration, producing a shared output. So again, a, a teamwork, a whole class, or, or smaller groups, but they have to negotiate, they have to challenge. It's not simply about the artifact that's produced, it's about the process of producing it uh, that will help uh, give them depth in their learning. And of course, production, applying the skills. So as a, a manager um, or as someone planning learning, you should look to see that these learning types appear in a variety of settings and in as interactive a way as practical to make sure that the learning is constructive, they're motivated in the learning, and it's deep learning. And again, there's a couple of short YouTube clips that give a, a slightly clearer explanation around those learning types. So what does that mean in the planning for remote learning? Well, the key, key things, key elements are to prepare learners to make sure technology, study skills, motivation, and um, information all that is set out as early as you can. You have to ensure inclusion safeguarding. Those, those general points of inclusion are part of the story. So when you plan it, you have to make sure that you've reflected on whether everybody can access technology, whether people are in an environment that's safe uh, for learning. Um, so those kinds of things have to be part of the story. Interactive and engaging materials, obviously, uh, is part of the element but you also have to evaluate whether your materials are as useful as you thought, or whether the interactions are going to be um, as constructive as you thought or, or too difficult. The planning, share that information, put everything out in full, um, and you do want to ensure the asynchronous uh, element is a, a significant element of the learning. Um, and it's not based primarily around um, the talking head model, um, the broadcast model of learning. Um, so they have to ideally have a chance to look at videos or tasks or papers um, at a time that suits them. And that's likely to make it more practical. It's likely to keep them more motivated. Um, one of the things that's coming up in feedback from colleges is the number of uh, students who enjoy the asynchronous elements because quite often it allows them to work more hours it quite often it allows them to to deal with um, kids that they'll be uh, supporting in their homeschooling and um, so that asynchronous element has to be ideally a fairly significant element of the experience you also and this is very important is ensure a sense of community and appropriate learner support um, so having uh, tasks to get them to work as a group uh, having warm-up exercises to have them uh, talk about uh, their background, personalities, interests. Those are part of it. And they will, what the research tells us quite confidently is, they will um, rely quite often on your personality and support, um, blended partly, but remote significantly, relies more on the interaction with the teacher than with peers uh, at the lower levels of learning. Uh, so you want to make sure that um, they understand where you're coming from, understand how to contact you, uh, and feel, you know, like knowing their names in the classroom. You want to know their names and things about them in, in the remote experience as well. Informative, summative assessment with an emphasis on regular and useful feedback. 
Um, feedback, no matter how brief, is an essential element of well-planned activity. And the feedback will keep them not just on uh, target, but it will keep them motivated. So it's not simply about improving performance, but it is about rewarding you know, good performance, good activity, uh, extra effort. Uh, and the feedback should motivate them and not simply tell them things they can do better. And if you're evaluating the online learning experience or remote learning experience, planning feedback, monitoring activities in advance, and covering engagement. The thing I would stress is engagement and well-being is probably more significant than progress because without keeping an eye on that progress, achievement, attainment, they're not likely to, to be there. Um, one of the things that I've heard a lot in informal feedback teaching staff is that although retention generally is holding up well in the sector, we still get a number of students who will opt out of particular subjects. So they will attend most things, but miss uh, subjects. Uh, and quite often that's around the level of engagement and motivation that's been provided in that subject. Um, so that's one of the things that we need to make sure when we're evaluating is to make sure the engagement um, levels are, are well attended to, are well regarded. Interactive material, uh, which staff are getting a lot better at, but the idea of providing extension and revision material um, is actually an advantage of remote learning. Uh, the idea that people can replay stuff, they can look back at other websites for more information, um, you can point them to resources that will give them more depth. Um, so when you put material out for a program, uh, you should have in mind what would be useful for those that struggle with the, the material and what would be useful for those that excel in the material and make sure you've given them videos, uh, books, uh, articles, websites that will give them uh, the opportunity to do that. And if they look at that material up, use that material, give them feedback on on how well they're doing it, how useful it is, um, and how you might share that with, with other learners. The range of learning types, we talked about the six learning types, but you should reflect on whether those learning types were useful and whether the learners enjoyed using the range of, of tasks and options that you've given them. And you should do that alive as you're going along, not simply a, a questionnaire at the end. Check-ins and submissions were mentioned, keeping that regular it will make sure that engagement remains. And learner analytics, uh, there was a, a previous session on learner analytics, but you should use learner analytics at a program level, at a unit level, um, at a faculty level to look for strengths, issues or trends. Are there people not attending? Uh, are there particular successes? Uh, are there things that you need to reflect on and revise? So the evaluation process includes all those elements. Um, they're not too different uh, from the experience on campus, but I think the emphasis is slightly more different about ensuring engagement, ensuring well-being, which is a much more subtle experience, uh, and keeping an eye heavily on engagement, not simply around success in the, the assessment, but in, in satisfaction uh, and in motivation and in enthusiasm. There's a few other resources around it that will help self-evaluation. How good is our college? It is still fit for purpose in terms of evaluating work. Um, there's also an interesting one. The, the selfie reference I've made there is actually a school's website, but it's a website that was developed and it has more than half a million users where they developed questionnaires that you would give to parents, you would give to staff, uh, and you would give to pupils to get feedback about your remote digital model and although specific questions used in that website are not ideal for uh, colleges the idea of questionnaires and getting feedback and adjusting your style uh, appropriately is quite a good one so selfie is quite good for getting ideas not for using directly uh, and there was also prompt questions that were developed by uh, our team the hmi team about our, our best future which again are prompt questions you can use within your team that, that might help reflect on how well things are going. And of course, learner analytics could always be better, no matter what you're doing now. Um, and it's also useful to make sure that you've checked internally that there are all the analytics that are available are available to your staff so that staff can use them directly to reflect on and improve their experience. 
I just want to summarize a few of the big messages then. Minimize stress by giving out control as much as you can. By re regular meetings with staff about not just progress, but well-being. Collect regular feedback and use it. And ensure there is some kind of model of design and planning that covers the whole learning experience, not lesson by lesson or, or unit by unit. And encourage staff to have active engagement through the range of learning types and approaches that they use. And of course, building in from the outset, feedback, monitoring and evaluation. And that's it as far as the presentation goes. Uh, so for those watching on YouTube, thank you for your attention and do access the other virtual bridge uh, programs.